Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block. And today, joining us on the other side of the mic is a good friend of the show. We have Raj Damodaran of MasterCard's EVP and head of blockchain and crypto. Sir, it's been, it's been too long since you last joined us, but you've been busy. You guys are rolling out um, product, new product after new product. How's business? It's good. Thanks for having me, uh, Frank. And uh, yeah, it has been indeed uh, like uh, almost a year since we last spoke. Um, yeah, we've been busy uh, putting out products uh, and solutions uh, in the space. Uh, we can we can we can talk about it throughout the show. But uh, yeah, this is a, this is an exciting time to be. Um, a lot of innovation happening in the industry as well as uh, Mastercard and partners putting out solutions. So it's a, it's a great time, uh, I feel, to be in this industry. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to it. What are you, what's most interesting to you right now? Yeah, look, uh, recently we put out um, a, a solution called Mastercard Multi-Token Network. It's really a set of technologies that um, enables people to build solutions on uh, on uh, blockchain. Um, this really comes from two beliefs. One is that we are looking to, um, we're entering to a space where we're seeing a lot of different digital assets come to fold, both on the payment side as well as on the asset side. On the payment side, you'd, you've seen a lot of uh, work happening on um, not just the central bank digital currencies, which may take a bit more time to come um, in, in different markets, we're also seeing stable coins, both from you know crypto institutions as well as financial institutions. We're also seeing tokenized deposits, which is also a new form of uh, payment token, if you will, that enables um, bank deposits to be used uh, using this technology. On the other side, you're also seeing assets, right? You know, people are putting out uh, different types of assets, all the way from carbon credits to taking advantage of NFT technology, carbon credits to uh, securities, bonds, and other kinds of um, assets that are also available using this technology. Now, if both the forms, the payment form and the asset form is available, you need an environment on which people can actually build um, applications, whether payment applications, commerce applications, and so forth. So we believe that is um, that's uh, something that uh, is here to stay. And uh, uh, MTN is, 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 think of it as a platform on which you can actually build compliant payment applications using both the asset side of the tokens as well as the payment side of the tokens. So that's just a start. Um, yeah, we're uh, we starting with the UK innovation sprint and uh, the response has been really, really great to see. We're setting it up as a more of a, a beta a sandbox initially, really because we want to kind of um, spur the development of applications using these technologies. And over time, that will go live. Who are some of the pilot customers on that front? Yeah, we, we haven't announced all the people who are going to participate yet, but we've seen interest from three or four categories, if I have to be really comprehensive. The first one is Web3, Web3 fintechs, um, so fintechs in the Web3 space. Uh, traditional fintechs who have been developing applications for businesses and financial institutions for many, many years. So you're seeing category corporations um, who are interested in ultimately benefiting from uh, th this kind of uh, solution and financial institutions. So use really the full gamut um, that you're seeing an interest in. Uh, a sample, for example, would be a uh, what the world would call DVP, which is, you know, delivery versus payment. You have an asset on one side and a payment on one side. How do you execute that? And a lot goes into it, not just the tokenization aspect of it, but also um, uh, it is interesting that you need you need an environment where um, people can trust and de you know make sure that the counterparty is KYC identified and there is a clear set of rules that people can participate on both sides of the spectrum, right? So that um, kind of environment it turns out is quite attractive for people. And if you really want to you know realize the full benefits of the blockchain technology, which is like the programmability, being able to be flexible, put out applications quickly. All of those things um, have to be applied to the broader economy, right? So if you look at the, the kind of uh, the payment instruments that are available in the blockchain today, it's limited to play, play, floating cryptocurrencies. It's limited to stable coins that are out there. Um, but 
you know, that's what a couple of hundred billion dollars together, uh, right? Um, uh, and if you look at uh, what powers the real world economy, it is the bank deposits, right? There are trillions of dollars of bank deposits available. How can we um, uh, bring that deposits into the digital currency technology uh, so that people can use that? What can what can you do to make a bank um, money that's in the bank uh, to be represented in the token form uh, in the ledger so that you can swap it for an asset on the other side? We think it has broad applications, uh, Frank, across uh, trade finance, the cross border cross border a B2B uh, which which all benefits from such um, a transparent way of uh, uh, and quick way of uh, you know sending uh, currency over cross border or actually paying for an asset so uh, yeah it's early days um, we, we are, we're not live yet and but we are very very um, uh, encouraged by the response we've gotten so far to what extent do the financial applications that can be built in this network, to what extent do those applications mimic sort of the, the products or applications that MasterCard's clients are already building with existing infrastructure? Does it, does it look basically the same at that top level, but the underpinnings are different? Or are we able to sort of um, create novel uh, applications that don't really exist in financial services? Yeah, it's a very good question, right? It's, um, it's, I think it's a bit of both. Let me give you an example and explain both of it, right? So at the, at the core of it today, um, we, we work on cross-border uh, transfers of value at the remittance side as well as for cross-border B2B. Uh, people work on today moving value inside a country, uh, for example, business to consumer, uh, or, or B2B inside a country. All of this works um, in different networks, not necessarily just the card network. We also support other type of uh, networks in our in our um, solution set. So at that level, absolutely yes. Um, but if you look at the, the cross border uh, today, it faces quite a bit cross border transfer of value. It faces quite a bit of issues in terms of how fast the money moves from one country to another how quickly the transaction can be settled and what are the risks associated with various parties as it moves through the correspondent banking system. That's kind of the nature of how money moves from one currency mm. to another today. We think if those assets uh, and the payment and the currencies are represented in the token form, you may see a tokenized form of a bank deposit on one end and maybe a central bank digital currency or a stable coin on the other end. If you both have fundamentally in the token form, we believe we can transfer the value faster with the less counterparty risk and so forth. So to answer your first part of the question, it absolutely can enhance the value prop of what's happening today uh, in, and provide kind of a better, uh, faster uh, way of moving value. Second part of the question, I think, is equally interesting, right? I believe that once you have them in the token form, once you're able to kind of express your application logic in smart contracts, some of them on chain, some of them off chain, fundamentally it provides a different level of building blocks and flexibility for you to build conditional payments and triggers that would be a lot more difficult to do using today's plumbing, if you will. So it's both. It's about delivering the current flows in a much, much uh, a better way as well as bringing new level of financial applications. And the, really the reason we started with this UK innovation sprint is to really kind of spur that development uh, uh, for both on how existing flows can be, can be addressed as well as how new flexible financial applications can be built. And we've already seen, and you know this very well, in the crypto world, um, once you had money in the token form, the innovation really, really took off in terms of the different kinds of applications on the DeFi side and the, on the exchange side and so forth. So we expect a similar level of innovation to happen here. In fact, some of the same players who are working and innovating in that space is coming and saying, oh, now I have a regulated currency, a regulated uh, bank deposit, which is already a, a regulated form of, the, of value and uh, assets that are already in existence. Now it's available in an environment where parties are identified. It's not anonymous anymore. 
uh, you know, which business on the other side, uh, potentially a consumer in some of the use cases. Now you can have a much more transparent application build that can uh, that can be compliant from day one. Mm. Um, I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. So when we announced Mastercard crypto credential a couple of months ago, one of the very first use cases for that is cross border transfer of value in the public chain. So when you move money from one country to another, people need to follow AML, you know, OFAC checks. Uh, you need to be travel rule compliant, which is necessary for the parties facilitating the transaction to be compliant before a transaction is put on the chain. So Mastercard Crypto Credential, which is the first use case, is the cross-border transfer of value. It allows the parties to exchange such information. So before transaction goes on the chain, you know for sure both parties know that it's fully compliant for that jurisdiction. Is it kind of, is it is it somewhat similar to maybe what um, Ave has in ARC or what MetaMask Institutional does where it kind of takes the permissionless sort of product and then puts an AML wrapper around it? Yeah, look, um, those two examples represent when you can actually take a subset of the parties that participate in the public chain, put them on a special version where you create a, an enclave, if you will. Yeah, we very much look at. Um, mm, yeah, our, yeah, yeah, we very much look at any any work happening in the public chain space. We will take this private enclave concept where the parties would be KYC and KYC and verified for a particular use case. I think this is very very important. The, the requirements for a cross border transfer of value is very different from requirements for a domestic transfer of value, if you will. If you both in California, what we need to do to uh, our, our businesses that facilitate our transfer of value, what they need to follow versus if we were uh, in different parts of the world. I think that is that is very, very important. But when we are uh, developing this uh, tokenized deposits, we've now for now, we've taken this approach of putting it in the private chain. So you think of it MTN as, as a set of technologies that will work in some cases using a private permission chain and some cases on the public chain depending on the use case. Sometimes the asset or the payment token could be on a public chain. Then this, our crypto credential provides a framework on which we can create a private enclave where you can actually have transactions. So all of this, this is all details, but all of this amounts to end of the day, the set of building blocks necessary for you to build compliant payment and commerce applications, whether you choose to do it on a public chain or, 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 or permission chain. And what do you, what will they, what, what do you anticipate they'll be transacting in necessarily? Is this, um, you know, is it, is it, is it crypt, is it public cryptocurrencies? Is it stable coin? Is it, is it something else or is it a mix of many different things? Yeah. So it's a, it's a good question. I think it's a very important one because this is what powers kind of, you know, all the payments, right? So there are three categories and they're in different levels of maturity. The first one you already mentioned is stable coins. I think it will be an important compliant regulated stable coins will very much be part of it. For example, the recent uh, Mika regulation uh, coming in, uh, EU helps uh, provide a framework and I'm sure other countries will follow. So that is one category. The second category is the bank deposits themselves. So the bank deposits themselves today are not in the token form. So one of the things that key building blocks that we're launching in MTN is that bank can come in and make their the, the deposit tokens on behalf of the customers available in a token form. So that I think is a key building block. That has, as I was mentioning earlier in our chat, there are trillions of dollars of bank deposits available that's held on behalf of consumers and businesses. If they can be represented on chain in a way that you can transact, that's great as well. How does that revolutionize um, like the global supply chain? If you think about the deposits that banks have, um, if, if they're may if they're tokenized and they're more liquid in a sense, um, and and can smooth out sort of the the network of banks and non bank entities that are involved in, you know, an automaker or a large manufacturing paying its suppliers to make payroll or move funds around. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a uh, so in that in that example that you gave, it's a very clear example where multiple parties need to coordinate when the money moves, when the invoice is sent, who pays for what, and what currencies that the 
buyer uh, wants to pay in, what currency that the seller wants to receive in, what are the conditions that need to be met before such a transfer of value have to happen. Today, all of this is coordinated not in one simple system or synchronous system. It is actually multiple commercial agreements, multiple different systems, often batch-based. It takes several days to complete this transaction, even if the money were to move in real time. So if putting all of this uh, allows you to uh, express, you know, if, if all of these are uh, available and the payments are available in payment token form, and then the assets themselves, including invoice, is available in the, what I call as the asset token form, maybe in the form of an NFT, then you're able to actually swap uh, one for another, right? And uh, we think the evolution of these currencies, the right currencies will change depending on the regulation and what's available in a given market. And the right, the, the different asset types over time will get tokenized. Um, so then we could, we could actually complete that. And you know, trade finance is a very good example that you gave where it can benefit, um, um, in terms of how fast the, the transaction is completed and the risk that various parties in the chain that need to, that need to assume it. Um, uh, and that changes as well because of the transparency, transparency and visibility that you get into into a transaction so i'll give you a, i'll give you another um, example this one is uh, is is already publicly um, d- discussed australian central bank ha- put out a, um, a an initial system for or a pilot system for their central bank digital currency and that was a proprietary blockchain system that they ran and they want to make that money available for payment in a public chain so we we worked we developed this is out there in the chain now uh, we, we developed a way for you to take the CBDC wrap it and bring it to the public chain so that it can actually be used to buy an NFT. So what it did what is the utility of all this forgetting the technology is that a currency that is actually created in another system non public chain system can be brought in a form to transact and be available for all the applications. A public chain can build. Imagine the possibilities if this were to be expanded to other currencies, including full deposits. So, what what do you think are the impediments that maybe stand in the way of every, you know, major financial institution, bank from? Maybe not making it specific to. Um, MTN, but to rephrase the question just a bit, to tweak it, at what point do you think most bank deposits will sort of be in a tokenized form? And what are the impediments for for banks to to get to that point? And also, I guess, to layer on another question on on top of that, will it it be so... um, Will it... Will there be room for non-tokenized deposits? Will there be any value there, um, or is it sort of a uh, a, a winner-take-all situation, for lack of a better better word? Yeah, I think the last question I'll answer. The last one, uh, I think it is definitely not winner-take-all. I think there would be multiple formats of the currency that will be there. I think it is important that all, whatever the format is, uh, there are some common ground rules, right? You you need to, this is need to be this currency need to be or the token need to be in a compliant form for the jurisdiction it operates in. It's very very important, right? If there is a regulatory framework under which that is actually put out. I do expect multiple formats to exist. I think we went through that. This is the tokenized form of deposits, regulated stable coins, in some cases. Uh, CBDCs as well. Europe seemed to be moving in that direction. Uh, uh, we see uh, China, for example, moving in that direction. So there, there would be multiple formats of the currency. The common attribute is compliant. It is available in a system that people can transact in a compliant way in that ju- jurisdiction. And and uh, you asked uh, the other question that uh, you asked is that um, do you see um, banks moving this? And uh, you know you may have seen. Um, uh, there is there is quite a bit of uh, positive encouraging signs there. Uh, you may have seen that we participated in a project uh, called uh, Regulated Liability Network, uh, which is a joint project with uh, several large financial institutions in the U.S. 
and Innovation Center uh, uh, at the New York Fed, uh, where we published the papers two weeks ago uh, on the business viability of a tokenized form of deposits, uh, the technical viability of tokenized form of uh, deposits, and the legal viability of tokenized form of deposits. All three are available as independent reports for everyone to see. Uh, what we really kind of proved out in this is that uh, we believe, uh, obviously, the, 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 the last word on this is, is, is need to be said from the regulatory point of view. Uh, we believe that tokenized form of deposits is just a, another format of an existing um, regulated um, uh, money. And, um, and like I, I talked about before on the, on the business side, there is really cross-border and, uh, and B2B applications are quite useful. Uh, in this respect, and technically you can do it. Um, uh, we can do it in a private chain. You know, if people are comfortable building this in public chains, um, you can see. Uh, I think the many uh, financial institutions are already experimenting. I've already seen people putting out stable coins, even financial institutions uh, announcing uh, stable coins. So I think we are moving definitely in this direction. Um, it is very hard for me to predict a, a timeline on this. I'm not going to venture one. Uh, but uh, but I think the direction of travel is very very clear. Mm. Uh, so I'm I'm curious. Um, I, I know that your sort of thesis is again like not winner take all. There's going to be different types of um, you know let's call it tokenized assets that sort of uh, serve as you know exchange mechanisms or like underpin the new rails of, of, a, of a new sort of financial system. What about from the blockchain, the perspective of the specific chains? Um, I imagine you you take a similar thesis that different chains maybe will serve different purposes. How are you seeing that maybe pan out now where uh, are, are you seeing sort of maybe like an Ethereum doing well for X or Solana doing well for Y? Um, uh, an Aptos or Sui doing something for, for Zed. And how does MasterCard think through um, it, uh, think through different blockchains just from its own internal purposes? Yeah, yeah very, very good question. I, you're absolutely right. You're going to see um, different, um, uh, again, using the same parlance that I introduced before, payment tokens and asset tokens. Um, Asset tokens being the NFTs representing various forms of assets and payment tokens representing different forms of currencies, you're going to see them in different chains for sure. Um, it is, um, uh, it, I think we're in the very early stages of uh, figuring out which are the top four or five chains that win 90% of the market share on holding a payment. Okay, that's interesting though. You see, there's going to be... Four or five is the number. I, okay. You know, look, sounds, the, what is the common like, rule for 80%, right. person, 90% person market share in new ecosystems? It's probably um, two, three, uh, take um, take like maybe 70% of it and then maybe oh, yeah. a long tail of few uh, others, right? We don't know who they are, right? Uh, I'm not here to predict who they are, but it's great to see all the innovation on the L1 and L2 chains. Um, and and uh, you would see uh, payment tokens and asset tokens dispersed among them. This is why it is very important for um, either a payment transaction or an asset transfer uh, where, where you pay for an asset is, is really work across multiple chains, right? The interoperability is essential. Uh, and I think we are in the early stages of it. And we don't believe the interoperability need to be done completely in a decentralized way. In fact, people who want to pay for an asset are looking for institutional backing. Um, to make sure that there is a common rules where if you have money in one chain and the asset in another chain, you can actually swap, swap them in a, in a very simple way that where counterparties are not risk of losing the money or the asset. I think this uh, is essential for building velocity when these, when you have a very fragmented ecosystem like we have today. So I think we'll, we'll continue to um, work on that. You know, uh, this is when I, we put out the empty and white paper, interoperability is a key uh, thing that, um, that we said is important to solve for. And we are working on, on, on that as a day one building block. The Australia example that I gave you gives you a template, right? Where we are actually bringing that, the payment um, uh, token from, um, one of the private chains into a public chain for transactions. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's maybe double click on that just as a um, a, a walkthrough of what goes into building out a CBDC. What does that process look like? Um, if if you were to if we were to sort of you know brainstorm on creating a launching a CBDC for dummies book, uh, what would be some of the chapters? Um, what, what does that look like? Because we, we, we talk about this all the time, you know, X countries exploring it, Y countries exploring it. What, what does exploration even mean in that context? And then, and, and what does execution look like? Yeah, look, this is, uh, this is a question better targeted at uh, an official building, the CBDC, but we, from our perspective, yeah. uh, I can share what we've seen. Um, uh, we put out a um, what we call as a CBDC sandbox to help governments basically set up the CBDC from scratch. So, you know, a couple of things about how kind of the innards of this thing work. Um, I think the first thing that governments think about is really what the purpose of this is. Um, what are they looking to do? Are they looking for putting out a new payment infrastructure uh, for, the, for the country? Are uh, they actually looking to... Um, solve for this from a retail perspective or they're providing a better mechanism for institutions or there's going to be a retail CBDC or an institutional one. Uh, what is the purpose? I think that's that goes into the first first level of discussion, right? The second is how they're going to get it to, uh, to the end users, whether that is businesses or institutions or consumers. So most governments have decided that it will work through the existing financial institutions and e-money providers to distribute the currency. Um, so means that it'll be in a, if it's a retail CBDC, it'll be another account um, that your financial institution would offer, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's, that's how, for example, um, Europe, um, Europe envisions um, uh, for the moment, right? And in China, they've decided to distribute through both e-money providers as well as financial institutions. So that seems to be a, a pattern there. If you look at the behind the scenes, underneath with most of the CBDCs are a blockchain-based system, but not all. Some uh, governments have chosen to use a, another mechanism to uh, provide a, a, a central bank digital currency. I, uh, you know, some would argue is it even a digital currency at that time. Um, to me, um, uh, if you were to build a CBDC and you want this to be available for businesses and, and, and consumers to use, uh, you need to have uh, day one flexibility built into it um, uh, in terms of protections, consumer protections, uh, privacy, uh, and all of those. And I think we are in the very, very early stages. But those are some of the decisions that the government go through to pick, uh, you know, uh, how to distribute. This is very, very early on track and we are, we are, uh, there's no live at scale solution at the moment and it will probably take many years for that to happen in a large economy and some economies may decide not to do it. They may produce, they may uh, decide to offer a comprehensive stable coin uh, legislation or regulation to, uh, uh, to do it and uh, uh, or in other countries, a tokenized forms of deposits may be the primary form where it exists. So it's not a uh, one-size-fits-all approach. We should get someone from the Australian Central Bank on the show, and, and Raj, you can co-host, and we can, we, can, we can ask them some interesting questions, because I wonder what the minutia of that, uh, from a, you know, on a day-to-day -day perspective, you know, they come to work, what are they... What exactly are they are they doing? Um, Look, these are these are fairly early systems, right? Uh, Frank, they are not um, they are live in the sense that in a limited basis, but they are not um, live in a commercial um, not commercial, but in a broad uh, mass adoption basis. I think we are we're still uh, talking, um, uh, you know, a few years away from that. That's yeah. happening. Yeah. So looking. Uh, towards the next few months, what are some of your priorities? And as, as it pertains to, um, you know, MTN, what, what sort of stages um, will, will sort of uh, unfold over the next few months? Uh, or rather, what type of uh, goals do you have? Yeah, so initially, it's really a focus on putting out our capabilities and letting the community build applications to see where uh, there is a product market fit in terms of the capabilities and the applications. That's the stage we are in. So the UK Innovation Sprint, we opened it up. 
uh, over 100 uh, different companies have applied to build applications on it. Um, we're going to have um, an event over the summer where we'll showcase some of those use cases. Uh, we'll uh, look to repeat uh, that in a few more jurisdictions in the coming months. And we're going to be picking a few use cases out of that to turn on live uh, in the near future. Uh, we haven't announced a specific market or timing on that yet. Uh, we're working that through. But what this is really uh, is to gain feedback for our initial set of capabilities from the, from the community, as well as work with them to build applications. So it's a, it's a quite a exciting uh, time ahead for us and, and the industry, I think. And uh, I'm quite encouraged by the response we've gotten so far. It's only been a couple of weeks since we've announced and over 100 uh, different companies wanting to build it. Is, uh, it's, this early stage is uh, quite, quite, uh, um, quite pleased uh, to see that. Fantastic. And I guess just looking at the market and the industry, um, what, what else is exciting you maybe outside of MasterCard uh, or something maybe you've just started to begin to pay more attention to? Yeah, look, there is a um, lot of work happening on the privacy side of things, uh, the ZKs and so forth, uh, ZK rollups and so forth. I think mm. this is essential for uh, eventually building a solution that is uh, um, that, that can be uh, partly in a, in a, in a public L, L1 chain that provides the proof and uh, and also can have private transactions for commercial entities, which is essential, I believe, for businesses and financial institutions to jump into this. So there's a lot of innovation happening in that space that's quite uh, quite interesting to see. Um, and uh, I also see this, uh, I think we talked about this earlier, quite a healthy competition on L1s. Um, and I think uh, that is multiple ecosystems emerging and, and that I think is very healthy for the industry as well. Uh, many more we can talk about, but these are a couple of top ones that I see is critical um, for uh, for kind of building um, the next stage of this. Amazing. Well, Raj, thanks so much for joining the program once again. Uh, we'll have you back on soon. Thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks, Frank. It's great to be here. Pleasure is all mine. And The Scoop will be back for you once again. Have a great day.